Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Marissa Waterman. I'm the marketing director here at the Academy. Here with us today, we have Jay Brady, a principal environmental engineer at Stanley Consultants, and John Cook, the water and resource recovery facility director for the city of Muscatine, Iowa. Jay and John will be discussing converting organic waste into clean water. Also joining us today is our AAES president, Dr. David Vicari. Dr. Vicari will serve as the moderator today. During the presentation, you'll be able to submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. Dr. Vicari and both speakers will address the questions at the end of the presentation. Before we get started, Dr. Vicari would like to say a few words. Go ahead, Dr. Vicari, how are you? Marisa, thanks, how are you? And uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we're, um, our, this is a part of a, a major initiative the Academy expand our webinar offerings. Uh, an important role for the Academy is in continuing education uh, for all our, our groups, for our board certified members, student members, uh, 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 member category members, and so on. So uh, we're here to educate. We're here to uh, help you with your professional growth. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your being here for that purpose. So let me start by uh, go forward with uh, introducing the speakers for today's webinar. Uh, Jay Brady is Principal Environmental Engineer at Stanley Consultants. He was the prime consultant engineer on this particular project for over six years, providing design concepts and then eventually uh, the final designs. He has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Iowa. He's a licensed professional engineer in Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Uh, John Cook is the water Res and resource recovery facility director for the city of Muscatina, uh, Iowa. Uh, he's a state of Iowa licensed grade four treatment operator. He has over 21 years of experience operating and managing water, wastewater, and industrial wastewater treatment facilities in Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Iowa. He's also the city's stormwater department director and is currently serving as the Iowa Water Environment Association's delegate to the Water Environment Federation. Uh, John is a graduate of Muscatine Community College and Iowa State University with degrees in business administration and journalism. Uh, Jay and John, you can uh, go ahead and start your presentation now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, we'll hold on just a second here. We'll see if we can get this thing going. There we go. So we're going to talk about uh, converting organic waste into liquid gold in Muscatine, Iowa. And uh, thank you for joining us here today uh, to hear us uh, discuss this very uh, unique project. Uh, it's been quite a joy to work with John in the city of Muscatine on this project and uh, we'd like to share it with you. <clears throat> Just a quick note here. Um, Thanks to Stanley Consultants for helping sponsor this webinar uh, and uh, see a little bit of about Stanley Consultants. We've been in business for 100 years, uh, focusing on environmental energy and infrastructure challenges uh, for our communities. So I'm going to turn it over to John. We're going to uh, try to get our video shut off here and, and just work uh, without video. Um, and John, take it away. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, we, this liquid gold thing is kind of funny. Uh, it was a, uh, a bit of a surprise to hear it called that at first, but that's uh, pretty uh, agreeable to me, I guess. You know, we, we uh, run the, the operate the water wastewater plant at, uh, in Muscatine, and we had a little flare for our anaerobic digesters creating biogas. The uh, flare was new in 2010. And uh, we hadn't really had a flare on the old digesters for probably uh, 20 years. They just kind of leaked off into the atmosphere. So when we fired it up, we saw the, the flame going there and we said, well, what are we gonna do with it now? And instead of just firing it off, we decided we needed to do something else. Um, since we had a lot of organic waste in our community, uh, particularly the ketchup packets that you see there, 
uh, which started this whole thing. Muscatine, Iowa has the largest Heinz uh, manufacturer uh, for, for ketchup and things like this in the country. And they threw away thousands of these every day. Um, so we decided we wanted to capture that and make more biogas so we could start an energy program. So we, uh, we said, well, what are we going to do with this, you know, um, stuff and how, how are we going to convert this into, into energy and how do we make more gas? Because little muscatine really wasn't making enough gas to uh, entice anybody to, to run an energy program. We didn't really have any money uh, particularly to do that. There weren't any grants involved. So we said we need to have more gas so that we have some private funds to come to uh, have a program like this. Um, so the, the, uh, back in 2012 or so, uh, renewable natural gas for vehicle fuel was all the rage. And that was going to save us all. And uh, natural gas was going to uh, be the, the cure for our uh, climate woes and everything else like that. And so that was kind of where we were headed with it at first. Um, we had a lot of things set up. We had a good frog program. We had some, some spare infrastructure that we could use. Our, our digesters were, were really lightly loaded. We were running 40, 45 days on our digesters. So we thought we had lots of stuff. And the, the flaring just said, hey, we, we, we have a lot of opportunity here to, to do this, but we need more gas. So where do we find the fuel for our digesters? And it turns out food waste was, uh, was a really key target for us uh, here in the Midwest, it's particularly where we are, we have a lot of food manufacturers and lots of organic waste and things going around. So we said, you know, let's find that 40% of food that isn't eaten um, and all that waste that's going into landfills and, and take it into the plant and convert it. And there's some places that are doing it on the, on the coasts, on, in, in New York and California and, and different places like that, but not a lot was happening in the Midwest. So we had to kind of look around and find where we were going to get our new fuel for the, for the digesters. So we kind of use the, uh, the EPA's uh, food recovery hierarchy, as you see here, um, and, and, and building our program that says, what, what do we do since we're only the fourth uh, best option for this food waste? So um, this, uh, when it says MARV up there, what's turns food waste and energy, that's actually the Muscatine Area Resource Recovery for Vehicle and Energy Program that we started. It, it actually targets all three of those first before we get to the industrial side. But of course, uh, we are the focusing on that industrial side right now today. And that's kind of where we are since uh, we, we discovered this massive amount of food waste that was out in our communities and in our region. So Muscatine is building our sustainability efforts here. We have a program where sustainability drives our, our programs in the right direction so that we, we link all of these three aspects of sustainability, uh, people, planet, and prosperity to really find those key um, projects. And the project that we did focuses in on that so well. I mean, it's just a perfect match for all of these things. And the community really embraced it. Um, I went through about four iterations of, of uh, city councils proposing this, um, telling them that, that it wasn't a guarantee of any kind. And uh, they still said, we wanna go for it. We want to be that kind of a community. So that really uh, speaks to our, to our level of, of appreciation for sustainability in our community. So there's lots of benefits to, to what this will bring. And this is how we kind of sold it to, to the council, of course. Um, diverting landfill space, which of course we're a regional um, facility. So we're not just uh, saving landfill space in our own landfill, the Muscatine County landfill, but landfills around the region as well, where all this material was going. And of course, when you do that, you lower the emissions from those landfills, even if they're gas capturing, they're generally pretty inefficient at doing that. So the more organic waste you could take out of a landfill, the better uh, for, for methane emissions from them. Um, of course, this is a good service for our community since there's a lot of a lot of need for this and a lot of requests for this kind of uh, a service that wasn't being met. So, um, the, but of course, the biggest thing that we sold it to was, was to recoup the capital. There was money to be made here, some, a new revenue source for the city. And anytime you can find a revenue source that meets uh, meets all these needs, uh, you're, you're really hitting on all cylinders here. So. So again, we, we first, you know, when we first started looking at this, uh, renewable natural gas was all the rage. The, the renewable energy credits that you could get for that were, were really touted um, as far as what you could get for it when you inject it into the pipeline. And, and uh, 
There's huge advances in renewable natural gas and CNG vehicle engines. And that was kind of where everybody's thought we were going to be going. Of course, I think we've shifted from that a little bit. And so, but this is where we started. And once we figured out that uh, vehicles were not going to be all natural gas, that they were actually going to be electric. And so we said, well, what are we gonna do with our gas? Since we, we wanna get it into vehicle fuel and energy, uh, since that is how we generate the renewable energy credits uh, for the revenue that we needed to generate in order to make this project worthwhile. So the, uh, <clears throat> the natural gas, the CNG delivery mode was kind of pushed and now we're kind of looking towards the microgrid uh, scenario that you see here, where we can actually generate power, um, we could store it, and we could push it back into the utility grid that we have uh, to realize what hopefully will become an, an E-RIN, if you know what the RINs are, renewable energy credits that, that uh, you can um, sell on the open market. And they promise us that an electric RIN is coming. Uh, it's been available since 2007, but none have been issued by the EPA, but they are working towards doing that uh, at this time. So hopefully that uh, becomes a reality soon. So uh, part of the part of the opportunity that John talks about is the existing digesters. And in the background here in the photo, you see uh, the two newer digesters at the plant. Uh, they were constructed about 2012. They're uh, about a million gallon, uh, sorry, uh, 938,900 gallons total volume. And their design uh, solids retention time is 22.8 days. Uh, they receive a mixture of primary and thickened waste activated sludges, uh, about 24,000 gallons per day average uh, and about a 37,000 gallon per day max month at about 5% solids for those uh, feedstocks. <clears throat> at the time of the initial studies, the city was taking in about 16,000 uh, gallons per day of fog and high strength waste and kind of processing it through the liquid train, which is not really ideal for handling those concentrated feedstocks. And they were getting a gas yield about 56,000 cubic feet per day um, average, but there's a lot of variability. And this equates to about 14 uh, cubic feet per pound of volatile solids destroyed. Uh, the facility also has four older idle digesters that uh, are part of a, a conversion. This used to be a pure oxygen plant uh, back in the 70s. In the 80s, uh, the loads had uh, gone away and they converted the pure oxygen plant to uh, aerated uh, activated sludge. And when they did that, uh, because of the drop in loading, they were also able to idle a sizable part of the aeration basin. And, and partition uh, part of it into four square digesters. They do need rehabilitation work, uh, but that's uh, another 2 million gallons of potential digestion capacity available. So as we look at the plant itself, uh, the energy use and, and uh, the biogas production at the time, the 30,000 cubic feet per day average uh, <clears throat> would meet the digestion building and process heating demand uh, with a peak of about 80,000 cubic feet per day uh, needed. This is equivalent to heating about 90 homes per year. Um, and of course, in the winter, we have a lot of uh, demand for the biogas for the process and digester building heating. But in the summer, then that demand drops way off. Everything's warmer. And so we accumulate quite a bit of gas during the summer months and, and it's all flared off currently. Uh, natural gas usage, uh, you can kind of see there 3650 therms uh, average per month, uh, but quite a peak of almost 8,000 therms uh, per month. And, you know, pretty substantial cost at $3,300 per month. Uh, and 7,000 during peak winter months. And of course that was, that was back in the good old days when gas was you know, below 350 a, a therm. Um, <clears throat> whereas uh, it's, uh, I think it was seven, $7.90 uh, $7 uh, today on the spot market. Electricity with 325,000 kilowatts per hour per month. Electric use, that's about $15,000 uh, electric usage per month. 
uh, feedstocks. Um, so when we start thinking about uh, co-digestion and, and biogas uh, generation, uh, what kind of feedstocks can we bring in? We want concentrated, ideally liquid material free of debris. Uh, but the city also has a fog program for their restaurants and uh, delicatessens, bakeries, any, any place that uses a lot of fats, oils, and greases in cooking. Um, and so they wanted to be sustainable and provide that service to their local uh, restaurant establishments. And so that was one of the key targets for this program. And then a liquid organic waste, um, that can be a number of different things a lot of liquid waste uh, from food processing, but also we get uh, solid organic waste as John was talking about, uh, with ketchup bottles, ketchup packets. Oh, there's all kinds of organic material that uh, is packaged that eventually is not used for its intended purpose, but it gets ended up in the landfill. Past prime vegetables, expired uh, produce, expired uh, canned goods from grocery stores, cafeteria waste from schools. These are all examples of organic materials that can be recovered and, and actually slurried and digested. <clears throat> so we look at the local potential, of course, the fog haulers, we talk about um, the local industries such as Kraft Heinz that John mentioned, uh, local businesses such as uh, our grocery store chain in the areas, uh, high V is one of the big ones, um, regional industries. And then we also, as, as John alluded to, we're thinking that we're gonna use this for compressed natural gas for vehicles. So we're looking at how can we use that readily and, and actually run a trucking company uh, has quite a fleet of, uh, of compressed natural gas trucks that they would be a potential partner to participate in this. So we look at our feedstock sources and our potential uh, usage or availability of capacity. You know, treatment sludge, we talked about that already, 37,000 gallons per day average. At the time of the initial studies, the organic solid waste or the total organics, we'll just call it, was about 3,000 gallons per day. And then, uh, fog and available capacity that we that we would have to reach our full digestion capacity that's available in the two newer digesters is about 23,000 gallons per day. So uh, we embarked with the city and the in a sub consultant echo engineers on a biogas waste shed study and we and that's uh, looking at what kind of feedstocks, organic feedstocks are available within a 60 mile radius. And that encompasses quite a number of industries and in, uh, including uh, ethanol and biodiesel industry, a lot of food manufacturing as John uh, mm -hmm. talked about, and then uh, the material that goes to the landfilling that we identify as organic. And so this kind of uh, breaks up uh, kind of some of the different sources if we were able to capture and process all of the organic substrates that are within an hour of muscatine, we could produce 4 million cubic feet of biogas a day, which would be 17,000 gallons of uh, diesel uh, equivalent uh, per day. So uh, obviously we're not gonna capture and process all that, but it kind of gives you a, a sense of the scale of material that's out there. So as we embark on our study, then uh, we looked at low, high, or low, medium, and high uh, scenarios. So we can kind of start looking at risk and risk reward uh, possibilities. And uh, this is just looking at, okay, feedstock coming in, how much could we capture? How much can we process? Variability in biogas production, what kind of uh, cubic feet per day of biogas could we produce? And, so on the low end, we're looking at about 98,000 cubic feet per day. And at the high end, about 185,000 cubic feet per day. And the two red uh, lines across the front of that graph at 133,000 and 167,000 cubic feet per day represent uh, what the plant is currently achieving with the co-digestion and the organic feedstocks they're, they're bringing in. 
so we thinking in terms of vehicle fuel again we, we converted that to diesel uh, gallon equivalents uh, and so this is uh, 425 to almost 800 uh, gallons per day which doesn't seem like a lot until you start uh, aggregating that over a year and and as you uh, aggregate that over a year that becomes some pretty significant amount of fuels at 150 thousand to almost 300,000 gallons of diesel a year. We looked at a number of different ways of utilizing biogas at the facility. One was uh, just direct piping that into the building furnaces, uh, treating the gas and then uh, piping it. And then we'd have to put in some additional gas infrastructure, a fairly low, low cost, uh, low capital cost uh, investment that way. A co-generation of heat and electric power. This has been practiced at anaerobic uh, digestion facilities across the country for many, many years. Uh, it's hard to make it all work number-wise from a capital and operational cost perspective. Um, but when you start putting in these renewable energy credits, that starts uh, paying down that capital cost and making it pretty attractive. Um, as John indicated, you know, now we're thinking about microgrid management and these ERINs, uh, the electric uh, power renewable energy credits that uh, we hope to see come out of uh, EPA here soon. And then uh, compressed natural gas for vehicle fuels, that was uh, number three. And, you know, the concern there, of course, is we produce this gas, we have to store it for uh, some period of time before it's put into vehicles uh, for use. So how do you manage that inventory of compressed natural gas? And then uh, the treated uh, biogas natural gas pipeline injection. Uh, that, that's a great option. It takes away some of the inventory management concerns. It allows you to maybe maximize your revenue from uh, energy credits, uh, but you have a, a quite a high cost of connection. You have a lot of uh, parameters you have to meet uh, to assure the gas quality. And at the time of the study work, uh, this uh, utility gas specification by the local gas uh, utilities was not uh, really in existence. Uh, since then, they've all come up with gas specifications for, for this type of project. So us being engineers, we ciphered the numbers, we estimated capital costs, we estimated annual costs, we uh, savings and revenues, uh, and kind of looked at a 10 year present worth cost. And uh, out of these uh, different ones, uh, the, the compressed natural gas for fuels really was the one that would show a positive uh, when all the numbers were assembled. Um, So looking at the overall estimated cost, the phase one receiving facilities uh, that we're really gonna focus on today, that uh, was estimated at two and a half to three million. Uh, the, the phase two digestion renovation uh, was 1.6 million. And then uh, the bio uh, CNG vehicle fueling facility that was estimated two and a half to three million. Uh, so, and then we have operating costs that that we also estimated for the study work um, for the phase one receiving, which is really the focus. You know, we we're looking at sixty to ninety thousand uh, dollars a year in operational cost, and we we'll look at, at potential revenues for the project. Uh, tipping fees uh, is an important aspect of this, and actually, the phase one. Receiving facilities uh, are, are efforts uh, looking at that from a return on investment standpoint it was really focused on just funding out of tipping fees because we weren't sure if and when uh, the biogas utilization component would be capitalized and funded and, and then implemented. Uh, but then moving forward, if, if we take and use that biogas that we're producing, we have a fuel value and then we also have these renewable energy credits. And basically that's uh, petroleum producers are paying dollars uh, to get these offset uh, credits. Uh, it's a federal program. Um, 
but then if you can get into uh, pipeline and, and that type of thing and, and call it transportation related, uh, then you can get uh, other states participating and kind of stack these credits and can be a substantial revenue stream. Okay, so this is uh, talking about tipping fee revenues. And so what we're looking at here is a low of about 230,000 to a high of 950,000 based on the volumes that were anticipated. And currently the, the plant, uh, as of this last year, it was, it was almost bringing in a close to half a million dollars a year in tipping fee revenue. So that's kind of right there at that medium uh, category for the scenarios. This is just uh, looking at the re renewable credit um, dollars. We're not gonna dwell on that a lot, but it, it does illustrate that there's some substantial dollars there. Uh, they are variable, which we will talk briefly about. And then fuel revenues, uh, and we did two different approaches here. One is if we just used it, it is uh, converted to city fleet, garbage trucks, um, and some of the other uh, vehicles in the city fleet to uh, natural gas, compressed biogas. And then also if we were able to, to sell to a, a fleet like Ruan, uh, the trucking company that has a lot of uh, gas fired uh, trucks. And so you can see that there's some pretty substantial revenues or fuel savings, uh, depending how you uh, characterize it uh, for the actual fuel value. And then uh, we stack all that together and you can see that the total revenues could be pretty substantial if the project was implemented to all three phases, the biogas was being beneficially reused and, and we were getting renewable energy credits. So we kind of looked at, you know, what, what kind of rate of return are we looking at? This municipality that's looking at this. So their timelines and time horizons are a little longer, but they don't want to end up uh, investing in something where the equipment's going to wear out before uh, they get some type of return. So we did a, a low, medium, and high in uh, really looking at phase one and two for the utilization. And as you can see, the the high and the medium delivered uh, under 10 years, which is kind of a marker that uh, we're kind of shooting for. But even the low end, uh, you know, we're delivering in under 20 years, theoretically, before equipment would wear out. So I wanted to speak briefly about some of the risks that uh, are associated with a, a project like this. And so we have to recognize that and consider that in our thinking. Uh, so one of the things is that maybe you, you don't capture the organic waste volumes that you thought you were gonna capture. Uh, that hasn't been the case for muscatine, but uh, as competition perhaps uh, blossoms as other uh, entities embark on this type of uh, endeavor, uh, there may be competition for that feedstock, that organic feedstock. So you could see lower volumes uh, in the future. Uh, on the fuel side for compressed natural gas vehicle fueling, you know, what happens if we don't have uh, the type of fuel consumption and sales that we were anticipating? And then our tipping fee rates uh, are, are, you know, we set a tipping fee. It's kind of associated with the solid waste tipping fee, but uh, if we have, again, competition from other facilities for these same feedstocks, perhaps our tipping fee rates would drop and, and that revenue would decline. And then uh, the renewable energy credits, the, what is that value? That value fluctuates, it's a, it's a marketplace. Excuse me for a second. Um, and that, uh, uh, those values can be phased out. Uh, also, it's a it's a government program, so government programs do sometimes end. So there's some some risk associated on fully relying on those RIN values, and then higher operating cost. Uh, again, uh, more labor, more equipment costs, more 
uh, utility costs, what have you, uh, could uh, change the economic dynamic. So I'm going to turn back over to John. He's going to talk about some of the exploration part of, of our uh, project. So this is the fun part. Uh, you know, when we started looking at all the food waste that was in the area, we said, well, what are we going to do with this? How do we get, how do we get the ketchup out of the packet, as it were? And so we kind of started looking around and I said, well, I had a, had a guy there in the back that then it was a, a had the muffin monster contract for Iowa. So I said, what, can you bring me a muffin monster? We're going to set it up uh, sideways and I'm going to start dumping stuff through it to see what happens. So we, we had it set up on an old pump pedestal there and we started throwing things through it. We actually did end up putting a screen, several screens that we had on the bottom to see if we could capture that trash and organics come out the bottom. But these are the kind of things we did to, when we first started out just to see what would happen and start exploring those, those alternatives and things that are going on. So. But of course, that's a pretty inefficient way to do it. But this is a very efficient way to do it with the uh, turbo separator from Scott Equipment. There are uh, several manufacturers of depackaging equipment out in the in the world. Um, most of them is most of them are made in Europe. Uh, this one actually happens to be made uh, out of New Prague, Minnesota. So being in Iowa, we really like that that they were really close. They're they're a Midwest company and they're an American company as well. Um, so for parts and different things like that, we were really excited about having that opportunity. And I went and saw a few of these around the country. Saw one in San Diego, as far away as Pennsylvania as well, uh, to see wh what their reactions were to these machines. And they were all very positive. So we, we went down that path and that was the decision that was made for us um, because, of, because of the kind of material that we had mostly um, and how we we're gonna process that. So, so this is what one of those uh, looks like on the inside. If you look at the barrel part of it, um, it's basically just a hammer mill operation where you see the shaft with the paddles attached. And those paddles can be uh, angled in certain directions depending on the product that you're running. Um, you can change those. So if you wanna keep the material in the machine longer, you, you angle them straight. If you want it to go through faster, you angle them um, more um, to, to get that desired result, but that's kind of how that works. And these will actually rotate at about uh, four to 800 RPM. This is a uh, typical material that we get, canned products. So uh, that's the cans as they show up at our plant. That's the material being dumped, uh, the organic that was inside of the can. And then the can itself looks like it's kind of just a mangled piece of aluminum. It's not, uh, it's not shredded. It's not chewed up, but it's just kind of mangled up a little bit there, but that's very recyclable material as well when it comes out in that form. So we, you know, we try to do that as much as we possibly can is, is recycle the packaging as well. So as we uh, explored and looked at uh, uh, model facilities, which there are very few of across countries, we started contemplating what it would look at here at the Muscatine uh, water and resource recovery facility. Just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of orientation. Uh, the co control building is labeled there on the right. Uh, the newer digesters are up at the top of the screen, so circular white uh, objects. And then you can kind of see the aeration basin and the old uh, digester area there. We first uh, conceptualized uh, what we needed to do here to receive these organic wastes. We were looking at uh, the area that is just south of the idle digesters that proposed receiving uh, facility. Uh, if the initial thinking was, hey, we got a, we got a once through drive, uh, two entrances, an entrance or an exit, and we could, we could site it there and everything would, would work great there have some area for some paving for backing into our uh, tipping floor, and then uh, want to take and manage this material so we don't disrupt our anaerobic digestion process. So we need to inventory our feedstocks, we need to homogenize it and uh, meter it into the anaerobic digesters to, to minimize uh, disruption of the digestion process itself. So this was kind of uh, our initial layout and we developed a receiving building concept here. This is just a rendering of, of what that looked like. Uh, had a layout here where we took our liquid 
waste receiving from the, the trucks that were driving by there uh, off the bottom of the page, hook in, discharge their load, go through a rock trap, bar screen, and get into a pump well basically below the turbo separator. That's the big circle, the pump well. And then we could pump out of that to uh, another area of the plant for uh, inventory management. And then the tipping floor there was where we were envisioning bringing uh, the, this containerized organic waste in the cafeteria waste, et cetera, to run it through the turbo separator. It's cut away, kind of illustrating some of the facets of that building. <clears throat> and then in this uh, here, this is the two uh, feedstock inventory management tanks, high strength waste storage tanks associated uh, pumps and piping for uh, keeping them warm, keeping them mixed, and then metering them into the digester. And you know some of the challenges of this project uh, include the, the limited number of bottle facilities. John went and looked at uh, quite a number of them across the country. Uh, there are very few that are actually doing decontainerizing. There's a lot of folks that are taking fog or taking liquid waste, but not very many that are doing the decontainerizing work that uh, Muscatine is doing. Uh, some of the concerns, of course, is the logistics and the trucking. If uh, the truck uh, folks, you know, time is money for them. So they want to be able to get in to a facility, unload and get out. And if you have uh, lots of uh, lines, trucks waiting in line, slow process to get unloaded, uh, that type of thing. Uh, they might lose interest in your facility. And then how do you right size this? Well, how many trucks are we going to get of material a day? How, how are we going to stage that material? Um, what size tank should we have? Uh, what is our peak truck traffic day versus you know average uh, truck traffic? It's a lot to consider that way. And then for those of you that have been involved with fog and fog processing from uh, grease trap uh, programs, uh, it's really interesting how much debris actually makes it down the drain in the kitchens. Uh, it's just uh, silverware, cutlery, uh, crockery, uh, straws, uh, rags, towels, uh, you name it, it seems to find its way uh, into those grease traps. And then uh, again, homogenizing these feedstocks, managing that liquid inventory, and then feeding to our digesters in a constant fashion to minimize uh, digester upset. And then at the site itself, we have some high groundwater issues and, and some geotechnical soil conditions that uh, kind of drive cost at, the, at this particular facility. So we kind of changed some things around with our initial concepts. We had a high estimated cost for that. We had, again, some of these concerns about how can we handle truck traffic? What happens if we need to expand some utilities in the area? And so as a, as a result, we ended up changing the location. Um, we eliminated the new uh, storage tanks and repurposed idle tank on site uh, and then uh, looked at using existing storage uh, building. <clears throat> we uh, went through that uh, iteration and again, costs remained high. So we reduced scale some more. We looked at manual screening. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, unused solid waste transfer and recycling center. In fact, we actually went out for bids and, and the costs came back higher um, for that re- iterated uh, concept. Um, and so we were really looking to see how can we make this work within our budgets. Uh, and fortunately, uh, city staff identified uh, unused space at the solid waste transfer and recycling center. And that has really been uh, a silver bullet, uh, silver lining to the clouds, I guess, so to speak, uh, for us, because it's ideally suited. Here's the transfer station itself. And on the left-hand side where that Mork sign is there, that orange sign, that's actually the recycling uh, portion of this facility. And it's ideally situated. Uh, we have loading docks uh, here on the left-hand side of the, of the picture where we can bring 
containerized organic waste in. We have a drive-through uh, bay there at the top of the screen so we can bring our uh, liquid haul trucks in. And this is how we orientated and, and organized this uh, for the city with the turbo separated there in the middle um, and then a tipping floor with a push wall so that they could bring in the cafeteria waste and other uh, types of waste where it's easier just to dump it and scoop it into that auger there that's at the at the middle of the screen and auger it up into the turbo separator. So this is just a, a quick little schematic of the process. Our, you know, we get our, our material in by truck, we put it into the feed hopper, it goes up the conveyor into the separator. And then we have our residual materials that come out in a residual auger that ends up in a bin or a dumpster. And the, the, the liquid gold, the organic goo, as I like to call it, uh, comes out and, and drops into this receiving tote. And we can do some screening there if need be. Uh, we pump out of that tote into um, tanker trucks to haul over to the water and resource recovery facility. And here's a picture of the turbo separator setup, and I'm going to turn it back over to John. Yeah, so this is uh, how we uh, orientated this machine. You can do it many different ways. It doesn't have to be set up this in this uh, fashion, but this worked out best for us as far as uh, the loading and, and uh, the trash receiving and everything. Yeah, we can go next. Uh, so this is kind of an example of some of the material that we have uh, showing up. Up in the upper left-hand corner, uh, all those tiny cans are little cans of Vienna sausage uh, that's made by a local manufacturer uh, not too far from here. They, uh, they send them to us, not even, they don't even have a label on them. They just kind of separate it out by a, a hardwood flat. And then our, our staff dumps them on the floor and we use our end loader to scoop them up and run them through the machine. So those are one of those opportunities where we have to actually um, capture the packaging for recycling as well. It's really kind of a neat uh, concept. Below that, you see is the lunch meat um, that you've probably seen in here, local grocery stores. Uh, we have a large Oscar Mayer plant just north of us as well that makes that, that makes all this shaved meat. Uh, it ends up sitting in a warehouse too long or they found something wrong with it in quality control and they can't sell it, can't be used for human consumption. Um, so they bring it to us and uh, you can see the machine that's after it's been depackaged and that packaging is not uh, not destroyed at all. It's just kind of opened up and the meat has come out and the machine really, really works excellently well with material like that. Uh, next to that is dog food. We have several large uh, uh, pet food manufacturers in the area as well. Um, and they get they get stuff that's wrong with that material. I don't know. They find metal in some of in some of the batches. And so they just say, Hey, we can't sell any of this uh, to protect the pets. So they say it's better for us just to take out entire yards of this stuff. And we end up with truckloads of uh, palletized and packaged dog food and other snacks. Now, above that, those pink and blue squiggly things, those are tubes they are about 10 feet long and they contain meat that goes into Lunchables. Um, so they would actually feed those into the machine. They would slice them up and stick them in. And they're, they're that kind of cracker shaped um, meat tubes <laughs> that, that we get. And believe it or not, the machine really takes those excellently as well. It just works beautifully on that. The, the plastic sheath on the outside comes out the trash and the, and the meat comes out the bottom. And it works in, in very efficiently to, to take care of those products. Now, John, uh, th these are materials that are off spec. Sometimes they're, they're culled from manufacturing. These manufacturers lots of times don't want to uh, have that um, out onto the market. You know, these things shouldn't be getting into the hands of the public. How do you deal with that? We have a secure location. Um, so our, our facility, of course, is locked. We have lots of signs saying that this is not material that is available for anybody to take. And we have lots of cameras. So we have a security camera system that's recording in multiple locations at all times. Um, and that the recording is available to the uh, manufacturers as well. Uh, so they can come and take a look at that at any time. Um, most of the manufacturers do send uh, the USDA down at least for a few days to watch the operation, to see the trucks show up and to watch how we handle um, uh, processing it through to make sure that this material is actually being destroyed and not resold or, or taken home or anything like that. 
Now you can actually certify to the manufacturer's back that you destroyed it. Right. So most manufacturers require a certificate, or certificate of destruction, uh, either their own or something that we have for them, and uh, they they will certify with the driver and with us, and we send that back to them. Uh, a lot of the trucks are are locked. They have a one of those actual, you have to break the seal uh, to open the trucks to make sure the drivers of the trucks are not stopping somewhere and unloading this material as well. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of safety measures that these manufacturers take to make sure that the, the product that they are uh, sending to be destroyed is actually destroyed and not sold or, or uh, taken home by somebody. So here's a little video uh, showing them how the material really works through the machine. It's kind of a fascinating procedure. This was uh, one of our first weeks in operation. So our, uh, our our forklift operator or our lift operator here is going really, really carefully and slow. These guys are work much, much quicker now than they did when they first started because this is all kind of new for everybody. Nobody really knows how to how this was going to work or how it actually um, operates. But we found the equipment that we needed. We found the rotating fork uh, mechanisms and everything else like that that we needed to facilitate getting that material up and into that hopper um, and it's uh, it's kind of some unique stuff that, uh, that that is out there for that the telescoping arm on the and the end loader was uh, was really key for us as well instead of just a straight uh, end loader so that we can maneuver that around to to, to grab other things and, and use it actually as a platform to to work on the machine as well so there was a lot of advantages to that. So that's milk that came from uh, Costco. It actually was still in the, all palletized. We dump it straight into the hopper to twin augers, take that uh, product up into the machine. And then the, the paddles break open the, the, uh, the boxes and the, the gallon jugs that are inside of the boxes. You see the milk coming out the bottom. And it's then pumped out of that tote and into the truck using a piston pump that's setting right back behind there. And then the trash has another auger, a single auger, uh, that actually lifts that trash up so that you can dump it into a, uh, a waste container here, which we then will take directly over to the transfer station, which is in the building right next door, which has been uh, an incredible advantage for us as well, is that the, the, the trash transfer is, is very seamless and easy because that is one of the biggest things that we found is that you end up with lots and lots of trash in a single day. And without having that advantage of being able to, to consistently remove that trash uh, and bring back new bins, we, we would quickly fill up with, uh, with lots of roll-off dumpsters and things like that. Yeah, I think that I think the debris quantities have been quite amazing. Debris quantities were not as, as yeah, we were, they were much larger than what we'd expected. So uh, going over to uh, the water and resource recovery facility, this is just illustrating uh, the scale down receiving uh, facility that we had envisioned that we ended up uh, even doing away with this for our budget purposes. Uh, but here, you know, just showing uh, some of the things you have to think about metering this material, um, running it through bar screen, the pumping, staging, how, how that is all done. <clears throat> And then at the treatment plant, here's kind of the process where we have our trucked uh, liquid food waste, high strength waste coming in. It goes through bar screen, goes into a storage tank where we have jet mix uh, mixing for that. And then it's transferred to the digesters where we meter it into the digesters in a controlled rate. Um, here at this facility, uh, we have uh, receiving in the upper right hand corner. And uh, what we have uh, there is, is John's uh, and his plant staffs. Uh, they, I think they're going to patent it. It's their own, uh, their own receiving facility that they created, for something very simple. It allows the, the trucks, uh, like in the photo to the lower, lower right, to back up, connect their uh, hose up, discharge into this, and then it just drops through ma manual bar screen down into that channel and uh, then gets transferred into the storage tank. And the beauty of this is that uh, John has the, the, the truck drivers actually uh, patrol that, that bar screen. So they, they get up there and rake any debris out of there so that uh, um, they don't have a few, the next guy doesn't have a problem. 
what it does, it also uh, makes those drivers think a little bit about what they're taking and bringing uh, to this facility. So you're not getting these just debris laden loads of material coming in. And then the lower left, uh, the you, you see the uh, skid loader there dumping uh, some material into through a hatch into the storage tank. And uh, that uh, that was original to the design, the, the uh, storage bin area that they set up uh, is not, that's something that the plant staff came up with. And that's for uh, handling uh, loose drier types of organic material where we don't uh, need to run it through the turbo separator, it's not containerized. Uh, so uh, bins of dog food are an example where they're not bagged. Uh, you can you can drop that into the storage uh, facility, and then they can drop it through the hatch into the tank and and add some additional water if needed to slurry that up. So this is a the storage tank that we repurposed was had a different use at a different time and had gotten quite corroded over the years. It was sitting idle. Uh, so one of the things to put that back into service was renovating uh, this corroded tank. So there's quite a bit of work in cl cleaning out. There's some material in there, cleaned out the uh, tank. And then we had to refurbish uh, the concrete that was corroded along with some of that rebar. So here's the uh, uh, end result in the, in the middle pair of uh, photo there. <clears throat> you can see the gray coating. That's the refurbished. Uh, concrete, the jet mixing uh, piping and nozzles are in the, in the uh, floor of the tank. And then the lower right hand, you see uh, our pumps for both jet mixing and then uh, transfer. So John? So one of the big things, of course, we wanted to do was make this a community project. So we have opened up a free drop site uh, for organic wastes. And there's a the uh, green light, red light sign behind the, uh, the lady there dropping off uh, that explains what can and cannot be accepted. Basically, we're going to take anything that uh, that people would eat, and that's kind of how you describe it. If it's a, a bare steak bone that have any meat on it, we don't want it because it's not there's no organic component to that. So that'll be on the other side. We don't want paper. We don't want compostables. We don't want dead animals. We don't want animal wastes. We don't want corn husks. Um, anything else like uh, that we can take, we do. And uh, we fill that thing about sometimes twice a week, especially in the, uh, in the summer months when people have a lot of produce of their own, everything comes in. And we, we, we really feel this is pretty successful without hardly any marketing at all. This has all been word of mouth. A uh, few things and some papers and things like that, but you know people don't read papers much anymore. <laughs> so this really has come about just organically, uh, no pun intended, to, to um, within our community. So it's been kind of neat to see. Uh, we also have a company, uh, the Screen R U Truck, actually goes around and collects. Uh, organic waste from several regional uh, hy V grocery stores and things of that nature. Um, so they've increased the amount that they can throw away. Back in the day, you had to have just, a, just an apple or a tomato or things like that that were compostable, nothing with any packaging. Now they can throw away that bagged lettuce that uh, turns brown and nobody's going to buy it, so they have to throw it. They used to just throw it in trash. Now they can bring it to us because our machine will actually get that uh, out, of the, out of the bag. And, and we, we expected about five big clients. We've ended up with about 10. And now I could say, honestly, we have probably have about 12 large clients. Um, and these large companies that manage them has been really the biggest boon to us. We have, they have companies that actually do their recycling for them. That way you find one marketing uh, or management company and they have multiple clients that can bring material to us. So that's been really the biggest thing that we've, that we've found worked to bring more material to the, to the facility. Okay, so just kind of running through some numbers. Again, this is kind of from the study study phase, um, but uh, but also real results. So in terms of tonnage, uh, in 2020, we started up about May, right? Uh, in 2020. Correct. And in that partial year, uh, the plant brought in about uh, 1,600 tons that year. In 2021, they brought in uh, 27, almost 2,800 tons. 
And then the goal is 4,000 tons uh, a year. So we're, we're steadily building towards that. In 2020, we had 3.3 uh, million gallons of high strength waste that was processed. In 2021, that's gone up quite a bit to 4.1 million with a goal of about 4.5 million gallons a year. At current digester capacity. At, at the current, yes. If we get our idle digesters uh, up and uh, rehabbed and, and going, we can bring in quite a bit more. Uh, so high strength waste revenues right now, uh, this is just tipping revenue. And what we're seeing in 2020 partial year, about $280,000 in, in tipping revenue. We're just under a half a million dollars for 2021. And our goal is a half a million plus, I would say. Uh, the high strength waste tipping fee uh, started at $40 a ton. And that was kind of uh, thinking about uh, trying competition with other solid waste landfills. And then, you know, what some comparable facilities are charging on the coast. Uh, we started at 40 kind of as an introductory rate, I would say. And that's gone up to $45 uh, a ton in 2021. And uh, ideally, we'd like to see it get up to about 75. Uh, but reality is it's probably going to be more like 60 uh, by the time it's all said and done uh, with, with our tipping fee uh, rates. Again, competition could rear, rear up and, and hold those rates at a, a lower rate. So uh, some of the operational tidbits here for receiving facilities. You, know, you really have to think about this truck queuing and circulation, how, how you're going to move these big vehicles uh, around your site, uh, the receiving volume, uh, how, how much are you actually going to get, uh, debris removal, that's an important aspect of that, especially if you're taking fog and some of, the, some of those other debris-laden streams. And then some people uh, don't necessarily think about this too much, but you know, how do you interface with the haulers? How do you bill? How do you administer that program? Weighing the material. You know, we're very fortunate at the recycling center. We have an existing scale that we can use to, to weigh in and weigh out so we know what the quantities and weights are. And then uh, you know, where you introduce introduce these materials into your liquid treatment train or your solids treatment train. And then uh, I'll just put a caveat, you need to kind of be aware of anti-degradation. At Muscatine, we have a somewhat unique system where we don't bring a lot of liquid uh, decant water back. Uh, it goes, the, the solids get land applied, they go to lagoons. And while we bring some water back, we don't bring that much back, uh, relatively speaking. And so uh, but if you, in a different situation, you might bring quite a bit of uh, ammonia and other loading back uh, from uh, dewatering or from other aspects of solids processing that could uh, impact your loading and, and may be a trigger for anti-degradation. Uh, John, you want to talk a little bit about the depackaging uh, keys? Yeah, well, this was just kind of a trial and error, you know, we didn't have any way of actually knowing what we're going to need, but we do have two full-time staff that run the uh, the Muscatine Organic Recycling Center, or the MORC, as we call it. Um, it can be run by one person. Uh, they can be loading the machine. They can be taking the trash away. Um, it's a little harder because we have to now drive that truck down to the, uh, the wastewater plant, which is only about a block away, but it still takes, it's downtime for the machine. Yeah, I have to unload the, the truck and then bring it back. But um, I would say staging is the biggest key to this, having lots and lots and lots of storage space. That was the big thing that, boy, I'm sure glad that first um, and second iteration didn't work because we were not planning well enough for the storage that we would need for this um, and the amount of material that has shown up. So um, that's been a, a pretty important uh, part of that for us. The, the packaging volume as well, you know, this stuff looks like it's going to compact really well, but it's not. It fluffs up a lot. It's, on, it's now open, kind of sits on top of each other. So um, you would end up with roll-offs everywhere if we didn't have the ability to just take this directly over to the transfer station and dump it on the floor. 
Um, and the different kinds of pumps that we use are, are definitely different than uh, what we've seen in, in typical wastewater that we always, you know, think we are going to use. Um, we had these piston pumps that we're now thinking of, of moving out into uh, centrifugal pumps, or I'm sorry, peristaltic pumps uh, to move that liquid slurry around a lot better. So, um, and then the dry product challenges are, are really big too. We have to have a lot of water because dog food uh, powder does not pump very well. You have to kind of really mix it up into a slurry. So lots of hot water as well because stuff gets greasy. So there's lots of different things that we found that we needed that we weren't, you know, didn't really know before. Of course, the, the material is, it can be a very abrasive. You can have all kinds of things that come in. You can have people that throw things in the, in the bins behind hy V that they didn't know was there, um, you know, that can really ruin your machine. Um, you have to have, you have to balance the, the amount of stuff that you bring in. And this was really difficult for us to initially do. We had to find out, hey, how do we balance the amount of, of, of proteins and, and fats and other things? So we kind of have a nice balance now. We know we can't feed straight dog food. We know we can't feed straight dairy. So we stage that inside of our building and we say, okay, we're going to run a little bit of this, a little bit of that, send that over on that day so that we don't overload our digesters. And figuring that out was just kind of trial and error as well. I think this table just kind of illustrates, you know, the variability of these types of feedstocks. Uh, OLR is organic loading rate. And you can see from these different feedstocks, that's pretty variable. The methane yields are, are quite variable also. It's just kind of illustrating uh, that. And, you know, the key is we want to avoid rapid bulk liquid expansion. And, and people say, well, what's that? Well, that's you know, rapid gas uh, production inside your digester that actually lifts your bulk liquid up. Uh, some people call that foaming, but this is beyond traditional foaming. It's, this is actually really expanding that liquid volume and uh, you get material coming out of, the, out of the tanks and this is what we're trying to avoid. It's just kind of a fun picture. We're trying to have fun with it. You know, some work from work t-shirts that we're all wearing. Um, and it's, it's been a really neat um, opportunity to do this. And people have taken on to this. We've, we've had people visit from all over the country now uh, to come see how we got this thing up and running. And uh, the public has been really happy with, with the results that we've had. Sure, and I think we'll also close out a little bit with some numbers. Uh, the, the capital cost actually was 1.8 million in construction. Uh, you had a couple hundred thousand dollars in engineering services on top of that. And then uh, some refurbishment that was outside of the construction contract of, of the recycling uh, bay that uh, needed some cleanings, needed some uh, light change out and some other things done to it to, to really make it work well. And then, uh, various pieces of equipment, forklifts, et cetera, added quite a bit. So the total project cost actually was 3.2 million in total by the time you, you add all that up. And then from an operational standpoint, you know, I think you remember perhaps that we estimated 60 to $90,000 uh, annual operating cost. Uh, the reality of it is, is it's more like 350,000, 400,000. We're, we're, net, we're netting about 150,000, uh, 130 to $150,000 uh, a year right now based on a half a million dollars worth of revenue. Uh, so between uh, wear and tear, between uh, labor and uh, some of the other things that have to come out of, out of the revenue stream, uh, that's kind of some accounting for you. So the next phase would be uh, to get one or more of these uh, idle digesters renovated. We're looking at plug flow uh, digestion. Uh, DVO is one of the vendors here. Um, and we've kind of taken a pause on that as, as we look at overall capital needs across the city's wastewater program. Um, but we hope to get on that bicycle uh, very soon and, and get this uh, one of the idle digesters renovated and and uh, providing additional ability to take feedstocks to meet this uh, quite amazing demand.
so I think that's our presentation. And I think uh, David could kind of yeah. steer us with question and answer. That'd be great. All right. Thank you very much. That was that was really interesting. And I love the Mork from Orc connection. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I think uh, I saw on Facebook that just this week, it's some anniversary, uh, maybe 50 years or whatever, when that TV show came out. So uh, only some of the older uh, attendees here are, are going to understand that reference, I guess. Uh, Robin Williams uh, was introduced to the world by that, by that TV show. So uh, great. Um, so let me go through some of the questions that are uh, that we received here. I, I think you responded to somebody, were, were you looking at these uh, when you, you mentioned about the ammonia being linked to the protein content? Let me see what happens if I click the answer live here. Uh, you can just answer them if you like, I can read them. Sure. All right. how, how are you handling digestate treatment, particularly migration, mitigation of high ammonia levels in the digestate? Yeah, I, I, I guess the, the, the first thing is we haven't really had uh, ammonia re reach the levels of the toxicity uh, that I'm aware of in the digestion process, and so it's really, it's really orientated towards, as John alluded to in the in the presentation, the the recipe, right? The mix and match the different feedstocks. Uh, John, you wanna? Yeah, the high strength waste doesn't actually have a lot of the ammonia in it. That we're not seeing that toxic level. The return when once we concentrate the uh, the digestate material and, and return water that we've decanted out of it, then we see high ammonia level that come back into the front of the plant. But otherwise we don't have that issue in the digesters themselves. Has that affected your effluent quality or are you doing nitrogen removal in uh, or, or uh, nit nitrification in your uh, wastewater treatment plant? Or what we, we do, not at, not uh, we don't have a, really a program for that, but we know how to do it. So we do it we, very well. We actually take out all the ammonia but we do end up uh, denitrifying a little bit in our in our finals this year. We have seen that we haven't seen that in the past. Uh, but this year we did, so we're kind of we're addressing that issue now to find out how we could be better denitrify in the aeration basins. All right, great. Okay. Uh, one attendee just wanted a confirmation. You said that uh, I recall hearing that you said the speed of this turbo separator was about 480 RPM. Is that right? 400 to 800, yeah. I mean, you can really spin this thing fast. Yeah, he, that, that was like, I think his response was, wow, that's incredibly fast. Yeah, it's on it's on a VFD, so we can actually adjust that up and down as we as we need to. You can turn it down from that as well, but the material tends to just sit and roll around in there if you, if you do it too slowly, so. Okay. And, uh, and you mentioned your staff is two, two people on it. Uh, this is just run um, one shift. Single shifts a day. We, we run one shift at the morgue right now, and that's uh, two, two full-time staff. At the treatment plant, we have uh, 20 staff. That includes operators, lab staff, um, and uh, maintenance uh, personnel. Okay. Um, Dale Gable, looks like he's a friend of yours. Uh, he says, hi, Jay. Uh, and then he said, you presented volumes of the, the um, HSW that were considered to be added to the digestion, however. Did you evaluate the volatile solids or COD ratios of this material to your treatment plant solids in the total feed? I'm not sure exactly what he's getting at here. Uh, do sure. you understand that? Yeah, we, we really looked uh, mostly at the volatile solids uh, loading rate, the organic loading rate. Uh, that's the parameter that's commonly used. And in Iowa, uh, we have uh, quite a, I guess what I would say a little bit more archaic uh, loading criteria of about 0.08 pounds of volatile solids per cubic foot per day. Um, and with co-digestion, uh, some of the studies have indicated that you can go uh, up to about 0.35, um, which is a little bit maybe beyond where we want to be um, in working with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources and, and looking at uh, uh, all the literature, uh, we kind of established a, a 0.18 uh, loading rate uh, that we were going to uh, uh, try to limit uh, the, the addition to the uh, digestion uh, to, to meet, um, you know, to keep a satisfactory process going. I think at times uh, during peak weeks and stuff, sometimes that gets exceeded. Um, as as you get 
a higher loading rate like that, you you I think run a higher risk of, of having digester upsets. Okay. Jim asks about uh, crushed aluminum cans being a possible revenue source. And I'll, I'll make this maybe a little more general. Uh, any possibility of, of doing some recycling with the solids coming out of the crusher? Yeah, the, of course, if, if the aluminum or, or steel or whatever it is comes out clean enough, uh, then the metal um, recyclers will take it and we will get some money for it. It's not something that I generally consider as, you know, I'm going to count on that money coming in. So I don't, you know, we make maybe a few thousand dollars a year out of that, maybe a, maybe $10,000 a year on that. So it's not really something I can count on. The other material um, does, some of it does go to an incinerator, uh, but that's uh, directed by the vendor themselves who wanted that done. So we actually have a roll off dumpster out back. Um, when we, when we process their material, we take all the packaging and throw it in that dumpster and they come and take it so that it can be taken away to an incinerator. Um, the rest of the material, we'd sure like to have the, the labor available to debox this material first. Um, you know, and I know there's a facility that the one in Pennsylvania does do that. They take everything out of the cardboard boxes and throw it on the floor to be then put in the machine. That way they can recycle the cardboard. So, yeah. Oh, there's another question down there. So you process the packaged goods. How do you deal with cardboard boxes? So yeah, that's kind of where we're at on that. Um, if we can, that goes down to a question down below. If we can do something with it in the future, we'd sure like to. A lot of these plastics that the manufacturers use, unfortunately, are pretty low grade. Um, that's really where this needs to happen. And we, it needs to happen at the manufacturing level to say, you know, we're committed to using a very highly recyclable uh, packaging product because the stuff we're getting right now, most recyclers don't even want. I have a related question. Do you ever uh, rinse off the saws as they're coming out up that screw conveyor and try to capture more of the organics or, or reduce the organics going to the landfill? Yeah, if you if you saw those packages, they are completely clean. Most of them. I mean, it really it really does a good job. The the biggest thing that we do find is that we have a lot of pass through of some lighter materials, the dog food. You'll end up with that passing straight through the machine. It's just kind of the nature of the machine. That stuff gets whirling around in there. It's kind of hard to to keep it all out. We have run material through twice. So sometimes we take the packaging uh, bin where we've collected all the packaging and we put it back through the machine. And we run it again. And that way we do collect some more organics out of that product. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, what kind of mixers are in your digesters? Uh, we have OTI uh, draft tube mixers. Okay. Two, two per digester. Yeah. Right. And I saw you had those jet mixers in the new uh, renovation. Yeah. And those are Vaughn jet mixers attached to a Vaughn chopper pump. Um, do you, what do you do for process monitoring? I guess in the digesters, volatile acids, alkalinity? Yeah, we do all, we, we do most of that. Um, one, of the, one of the unique things that we found that, that they do in Europe is called a FOSTAC, which is actually kind of the same alkalinity to, to fatty acid ratios, but that's, what the, that's a ratio that they use. It's a number that we kind of try to stick with. It seems to work most of the time, um, uh -huh. but we've found with everything that everybody says, that here's a, perfectly stable digester. Everything is, should be running completely smooth and the thing is foaming over or blowing up on us. So <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to tell. Sometimes it's, it's more or less a, a, an art than a science sometimes. But yeah, we do monitor all those and make sure that we're staying within those parameters just so we're kind of catching ourselves if we, if we, if we get over on top of that. Yeah, I remember looking at that ratio when I worked in the plant. So that's done in the- Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did the cost analysis account for debris from depackaging? And if yes, how much per year? So how much the debris from depackaging? I guess that's your. I, I think um, I'll answer it this way. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of things that weren't fully accounted for in the early studies when it comes to handling this containerized material. I think we were really more focused on uh, the liquid uh, side as, of operations. Uh, so the debris wouldn't have been accounted to, not to the extent that uh, we see it. And then the other thing, when we when we relate to the, the high cost uh, versus the revenue, well beyond maybe what we had anticipated, 
is we have some we have some costs that we were not not planning on ever having, which uh, as an example, uh, the water and resource recovery facility, John here, he pays the, the city's solid waste uh, division $60,000 a year in rent for use of that recycling bay. Now that's a cost we never envisioned occurring. So it's some of those types of things that, uh, mm -hmm that are driving up our costs that, that well beyond what we had thought. Fortunately, we're getting adequate tipping revenue to, to cover that, plus you know, have a net to help defray the capital investment. Um, but yeah, we, we, I don't think any of us uh, uh, properly accounted for the, the residuals. Yeah. Um, Paula Inca is a, a master's student in environmental engineering in Montana State and asks uh, about uh, the biogas. Now, you're flaring the biogas currently, you're not recovering the flyer gas, is that the case? That, that, that's correct, uh, yeah. So uh, the, the recovered organics are uh, anaerobically digested and that uh, digestion process produces the biogas. And so then, uh, and then plans, we flare it. Are there, you talked about some options for recovering it. Uh, are there any active plans to implement any of that? Uh, there's there's visions, but there's <laughs> there's uh, you know we uh, we're in search of capital dollars to to fully implement to the end destination, which uh, I think the vision right now is is to to look at uh, cogeneration and microgrids uh, mm -hmm. to to take advantage of. Uh, these uh, renewable energy credits for electric power production, which as John indicated, you know, it's something that EPA has, uh, has, but hasn't issued. Uh, so there's a program, but they haven't actually issued any of these credits. And that's what uh, we're, we're uh, anxiously awaiting to see uh, the, the agency come forward with a, with a viable uh, electric power renewable energy credit. Um, so uh, are you at least covering the energy demand for the treatment plant or any internal uh, demands? Well, you could, I mean, you could power the plant with it, but the, the, the electricity that we would generate would be more valuable to resell. So we would actually be, uh, if we generated it, we would sell it back to the grid because we would we would make revenue more than what we could buy it for. Uh, um, with these renewable energy credits, that's kind of how that's going to work. So, so we probably wouldn't use it to run the plant unless something happened to the outside world. And if the power went out, then we could actually run the plant with the power that we generate. And that's kind of how the microgrid works is we have enough storage in order to run certain facilities or certain portions of our facility. But generally on a day-to-day on -a -day basis, we would be selling that back into the market for revenue generation. So other than the environmental benefit of keeping these organics out of uh, landfills or wherever, uh, what, was, what was the benefit to you to undertake this whole uh, operation? You're not recovering the energy from the gas, although you could in the future. Uh, so uh, what's the overarching purpose of this with respect to your utility? Yeah, obviously the, the revenue generation was was key to, to getting this passed through. And I mean, yeah. you could just say it's just an environmental thing to do, but nobody's going to let you spend $3 million just to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so the revenue generation was it. And, and selling the gas is not really just an option. It is something that we are going to do eventually. I mean, you wouldn't do this just to make $150,000 a year. So you really have to have that plan uh, ready to go. Um, we, you know, it's kind of a chicken egg. Which one do you do first? Do you, do you try to secure, you know, some energy program first and then get the material? And then it doesn't really work that way because nobody wants to do business with you when they don't know there's no guarantee uh, of gas generation. So we really had to build this first to prove that we did have enough material in the area and that we could produce that amount of gas. And now we're getting calls and we're, we are in discussion with lots of other companies and entities about how we're going to deal with this gas and, and, and uh, maximize our revenue generation from that. Um, it's just kind of a leap of faith is what it really was. It's what it comes down to. Okay. Um, I think you addressed this. What's the volume of waste material from the recycling center that are sent to a landfill and what does that cost you? 
Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the um, the volumes. I, I try not to think about it because <laughs> I don't like throwing stuff in the landfills. Obviously, that was my my motivation was to not have things go to the landfill. Um, but I know we spent about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year uh, to dispose of that material, which was something else that I kind of thought maybe we could negotiate out with the with the other city department that we're with. We haven't gotten there yet, so that would help our revenues as well. But I know they got costs as well to do that. So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, and uh, so someone's asked about the number of employees. You mentioned that as two, right? Uh, and someone else asks, where you, how do you clean the biogas before selling it? But you don't. Uh, so th that's just something for the future. Right. 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 All right. As ESG adoption accelerated interest in your operation. Now, I said ESG, in other words, is uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, um, um, uh, considerations for the company. I guess the companies that are your clients that you're disposing the wastes for. Uh, does that give them maybe bragging rights uh, that they're disposing of their waste in a more uh, environmentally acceptable way? Absolutely, that's that's their motivation uh, straight up. I mean, it doesn't it, it costs them more to send it to me than it does to the landfill. So they have to have that kind of motivation behind their operation to do this. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to them. But the, it, it is beyond just the manufacturer. It's the who the manufacturer sells to. They drive that as well. They say, you know, we won't buy this from you if you don't dispose of your waste in a, in a responsible way. So they look for that and they put that into the cost of their, of their uh, business and they have to prove that as well. So yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into um, who's, who's driving this kind of, a, a, of operation to say, you know, we want this and this is important to us as a, as a, as a company and to our clients. Yeah. I'm glad to see that. When I, when you showed those photographs of those piles of, of uh, waste food and so forth, uh, it, it makes me sad, actually, because uh, I, I know about the huge problem we have with food waste uh, and to think of all the resources that, are, that go into waste with that. Uh, if we don't at least recover some benefit from that, 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 is, uh, that is a shame. Um, last question I have here is about sludge disposal. I think you mentioned, uh, so that I assume it's dewatered. If so, what happens after it's being dewatered? So, yeah, our, our sludge is sent to a, a storage pond that's about two miles from the treatment plant. It's in the middle of a farm field um, that rotates corn and soybean. Actually, it's in the middle of about 800 acres of farm field. Um, these, these raised uh, lagoons or storage ponds, there's two of them, two six million gallon lagoons. So we store in one all year and then we decant water off of that. So we have a floating pump. So as the solids sit in the pond, they settle to the bottom, we decant the water off into the other pond that is next to it. And then that water comes back to the treatment plant. And then in the fall, um, when the soybeans have come out and the crop is going, or the, the ground is going to be corn next year, uh, we land apply that. So we have a, a drag line system where we have hydrants and, and pipes under, under the ground and our tractors hook up uh, to the hydrant and have a drag line hose behind it. And then the tractor has an injection bar, which actually injects that biosolid uh, material into the ground about eight inches. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty neat system. It's really easy. It's clean for us. The farmers get it for free. We don't charge them for it because, you know, we don't, we don't have dewatering machines. We don't have presses. We don't have centrifuges. We don't have all these other kinds of things. It's a pretty neat and clean system for us to get rid of it. You have to, uh, are there regulations about uh, how much you can apply per, per acre? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have to meet agronomic loading rates um, according to 503 regs um, from EPA. So, so yeah, those are, those are well established. Now, we do, have, we, we, we do have space there as well, which is good because the, obviously the, the nitrogen limits and, and phosphorus loading to this material has gone up. So they are getting more per acre um, loading to the, to the ground. But we do still have some room there. So, um, you know, as, as more material comes in, we have to be cognizant of that, either find more land to apply this to, or we have to figure out something else to do with the solids. But there is, there's a lot more land around that area that we are not applying to. So we should have some, some capacity that if we needed to thin that out a little bit so, so, so we stay under the agronomic rate, we could do that. Yeah. Uh, I think you also mentioned this, but maybe you could just remind us. How do your tipping fees compare to landfill tipping fees? 
our, our landfill tipping fees in Muscatine are $45 a ton. Um, they're as cheap as $25 a ton, about uh, 30 miles away from us. And there are places where it's $65 a ton. But across the river, it's like $10 a ton. So yeah, there, there's a lot of options for people of what to do with this material. So the fact that they bring it to us and are willing to pay $45, $50 a ton is, is pretty good. And the last question that, that we have here is, uh, uh, opens a can of worms. Have you measured PFAS content in the co-digested sludge? And no comment. That that <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, and for that matter, uh, ensuring that, you know, that there are other, aren't other industrial uh, chemicals in there. Um, yeah, we, 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 are, we are not required at this time to, 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 to test for PFAS. We have done that and we have not found We've been under the detectable limit for PFAS in our, in our biosolids. Um, that's just so our farmers have peace of mind that this isn't doing that. Really the, the, you know, the organic, the food waste that we get is not gonna contain that particularly that we don't think. So we haven't seen it in our, in our biosolids at all. Great, thank you. And the last Q and A is simply a thank you. So I'll, I'll echo that. Uh, this has been really fascinating for me. Uh, I, I do a lot of work uh, related to uh, uh, um, pollution and, and, and agronomy. So uh, the connection with that is something that I appreciate. Sure. So Jay sure. and John, thank you so much for, for this, your presentation. Um, I think I, at this point, I turn it back to Marisa. She has some yes, that's right. uh, yes, thank you so much everyone for all your questions. And thank you both John and Jay for sharing your knowledge with us today. If anyone would like to reach out to them directly, please feel free. Um, John and Jay, if you can just type in your email address into the chat, that would be great. We do now have an added feature to our webinars we're trying out. It's called an after party. Uh, both speakers have agreed to stick around for a few minutes to answer any additional questions you may have. We'll end our event and we'll stop recording, but if you wanna stick around for a minute, you'll have the opportunity to ask some more questions in a smaller group and you can maybe even put your camera on. Um, Marisa, questions verbally. Yes. Marisa, uh, one person did ask, will slides be posted or, or the presentation made available? Yes, I will be sending out a link to the recording and then the slides will be available on our website uh, probably tomorrow or later in the week. Terrific, thank you. Yeah. And a few more items to mention. Uh, we have several yeah. webinars planned out. In the near future, so you can go to aaees.org slash events to check them out and register. And if you're interested in sponsoring an upcoming webinar, please reach out to me directly. My email address is mwaterman at aaees.org. Just a reminder, if you're not yet an AAES member and you're considering joining the Academy, please email me to discuss our membership options. And last but not least, not least, I know everyone's wondering, the PDH certificates for this event will be sent out shortly. That's all for today. Again, if you'd like to stay for the after party, please do. And thank you so much. Have a great day. And thanks again to Stanley for sponsoring this event. Bye-bye, everyone. So that's